Kubrick was obsessed with making every frame in 2001 perfect. In several photos of Kubrick on set, you can see him holding a still camera. This was because he was constantly testing the exposure of every shot. Stanley would, uh, would, would take maybe 50 Polaroid shots, testing the lighting for every single setup. Uh, every time he set up for a new scene. It took hours and hours to light them. I mean, many more hours in between sequences than you normally have in a film. I mean, film is always about hurry up and wait, but more so with this film than any other film I've ever done. And he was also obsessed with the focus being absolutely perfect in every shot. Even, even on 2001, I, I know from a friend that was on that film, he would put a, a television camera looking at the, looking at the focus charts um, to, to try and he, I think he was, he was fanatical about focus, of, of sharpness of, of, of lenses. The, the, the television camera would look at the markings of the lens and then he, he would photograph the television set with the focus chart that he was photographing. So he could see as somebody was moving the focus, he could watch on, the on, the, on his projected rushes to see where the focus was the sharpest. Jeremy Bernstein remembers seeing Kubrick handed a Polaroid camera. He said, I asked Kubrick what he needed the Polaroid for, and he explained that he used it for checking the subtle lighting effects for color film. He and the director of photography, Jeffrey Unsworth, had worked out a correlation between how the lighting appeared on the instantly developed Polaroid film and the settings on the movie camera. I asked Kubrick if it was customary for movie directors to participate so actively in the photographing of a movie, and he said succinctly that he had never watched any other movie director work. Originally, he said, he had planned on 130 days of shooting for the main scenes, but the centrifuge sequences had slowed them down by perhaps a week. I take advantage of every delay and breakdown to go off by myself and think, he said. Something like playing chess when your opponent takes a long time over his next move. Kubrick had a blue trailer that was once Deborah Kerr's dressing room converted into a mobile office. He would have it wheeled onto the set and it allowed him a quiet and private place to write while things were being set up and worked on. He would often have the actors join him in the trailer to improvise on dialogue in order to distill it to its simplest form and make it sound more natural. Andrew Birkin remarked, he had that wonderful paradoxical nature. He was crazy about systems and filing and the ordered mind mind, but his office was always chaos. There were papers all over the place, even on the floor. Bernstein also recounted visiting Kubrick's writing trailer. When we reached the trailer, I could see that it was used as much for listening as for writing. For in addition to the usual battery of tape recorders, Kubrick writes rough first drafts of his dialogue by dictating into a recorder, since he finds that it gives it a more natural flow. There was a phonograph and an enormous collection of records, practically all of them contemporary music. Kubrick told me that he thought he had listened to almost every modern composition available on records in an effort to decide what style of music would fit the film. Here again, the problem was to find something that sounded unusual and distinctive but not so unusual as to be distracting. I just don't see how, if you're using orchestral music, sure. why should you go to a hundredth rate, mm -hmm. I should think it must be like that, uh, composer. There's no point in having somebody try to write something like Mozart. Oh, no, no, I wasn't saying that. Well, <laughs> in, mean the in 2001 I used uh, Ligeti. Well, let's say 2001 you could have gotten somebody to write it specially, but um, it's such a colossal gamble, and it's done at the last minute. You, if, I mean, if you're not happy with it. Mm -hmm. It's always done 12 Just weeks or something. So if you find the music that seems right, it seems pointless to uh, not to use it. The music playing during the intermission is Atmospheres by Ligeti. It was the same as the overture to the film. The first images we see after the intermission are of the Discovery spaceship and the pod rising over the command module. Kier DeLay notes that this shot is visually similar to the very first shot of the film. Special effects artist Brian Johnson takes us through a typical day of shooting these models. So we would go to the storyboards and take the shot that we were doing on any particular day, and then I would set it up on the blacked out soundstage. The electrician would come in and set up the lights where Stanley wanted them. Stanley would set the key light where he wanted it, then we would blanket the exposure. We had problems with processing the film because we at times would work with an f-stop of 128 for about 10 minutes, which was basically an aperture the size of a pinhole. This was because we had to get a certain depth of field, but also everything had to always be in focus as well. So we'd shoot something, send it off, and it would oftentimes be rejected because it wasn't perfect. From there I had to clean the negatives that Stanley had shot. Then Stanley would go over those to determine which part of the image he wanted to appear on the screen. Once he had decided, he would have someone cut out the model from the composite made from the negative with a surgical scalpel, and then that would be placed onto the glass plates. Once the glass plates were made, they would re-photograph those with a film camera. The cameras would track along with the image or move in on it as was necessary. We didn't very often shoot the models with a film camera, but we shot more with a still camera, really. It was animation. 
It was important to do it this way because then we could go back and re-re-photograph those with background projections in place. An example of that would be how one sees space in the background via the windows of the space station. I was given the job of getting all of the models ready to do the still photography with Stanley. We had an electrician, myself, and Stanley on a completely blacked out soundstage. Stanley would work for hours lighting the models, and then he would shoot the 4x5 plates, and those plates would then be used to make enlargements for the animation. We used Polaroid Land 300 stock. It was the same stock that spy planes used, and it was very fine grained black and white. It was very high process stock. It was fantastic stuff. In a separate interview, this time with Brian Loftus, Loftus explains the separation process. The first real work that I ever did in the film industry was on matte paintings. Stuff like the painting of a landscape that you put around a castle and then re-photograph. I had acquired experience working that way but with separation masters, which was when color film was broken down into three different layers of colors. It was a good way of reproducing imagery because effectively you were working with black and white film as a result, and it would produce a very fine grain image. Because of all of the special effects shots in 2001, Stanley had decided that he wanted to do the entire film via the separation process. This detailed taking a shot of the spaceship in 2001, and then adding a mat of the stars behind it, and then re-photographing it, and adding other elements in as well, and then re-photographing the entire thing altogether. He wanted to use the separation process because when you work that way, you could instantly be able to see in the shot if anything had gone wrong in the rephotographing when you put the YCM, yellow, cyan, magenta, colors of the film back together again off of the negative. Every shot in 2001 that required process work went through the YCM process, and at the end of it we had something like 250,000 feet of film that we had worked on. The film was shot on 65mm and there was only one optical printer in the world that could accommodate that. It was owned by Linwood Dunn in Hollywood, and Stanley had it flown over to England and I was the person who was put to the task of running it. All of these shots are breathtaking nearly 50 years later. One of the most fascinating things about them is how they approach these shots. Completion of the special effect shots often involved the addition of many different elements, which may have included miniature projection, stars, Earth or Jupiter, the sun, and quite often the addition of a second model matched in scale and motion to the first, such as the Orion spacecraft approaching the space station, or the pod moving relative to the Discovery spacecraft. All of the movements and exposures of the additional elements would be keyed to match the first original photography of the main model shooting. One of the most interesting aspects of this complex combination of models, matted stars, Earth, Moon, Sun, etc was that few if any of these shots were pre-planned or designed in advance. Each shot merely grew from its first element. Subsequent elements were added and tested for speed, exposure, movement, etc. and were accepted or rejected according to their merits for that shot, with little or no regard to that shot's relationship to any previous or subsequent shots. In most cases, shots would be matted, combined, and completed in their entirety even though only a few feet or seconds would be used in their final cut of the film. Although this technique may have seemed wasteful, time-consuming, and expensive, it was the only way that latitude could be available in the final cutting of the film. The special effects could be cut just like live action, in that each particular action or story point was covered by a multitude of angles and shots, each of which was carried to completion. This time, Frank is the one who goes out to replace the AE-35 unit. In an early draft of the screenplay, there's a part that was cut that shows how the men decide who goes outside the ship. The description is as follows. We see Bowman and Poole go to a cupboard labeled in paper tape, Random Decision Maker. They remove a silver dollar in a protective case. Poole flips the coin. Bowman calls head. It is tails. Poole wins. Poole looks pleased. This was when Dave went out earlier to retrieve the AE-35 unit, so it appears that they don't enjoy going out. They filmed all of the scenes with one of the two men in space in a very large soundstage. For this shot, he was being lowered by a wire. The close-ups of me doing the work were me, but the long shots were a stuntman hanging by wires. Here we are looking at the shooting of Frank's death scene. A stuntman would jump from this platform while attached to a wire. The camera was positioned underneath him and looking straight up. The camera would move with the stuntman and since the wire was attached to his back, the camera couldn't see the wire because it was hidden behind his body. Poole in a weightless condition by hanging from the ceiling is hauled toward the rescue pod piloted by Bowman. Poole was given a spin. His wire harness had a pivot joint and he rotated until he moved into the pod arms. The stuntman spent long sessions hanging upside down and would nearly faint from heat fatigue, and lack of air. The part where Dave retrieves Frank's body, and it shows the body gently and weightlessly bump against the pod's arms, had always baffled me because it really looks like he's floating through space, and it didn't look like he was simply on a wire. Well, he was on a wire, but there's a little bit more to the effect. They originally tried using a dummy, but it didn't have the proper look of a floating body they were going for. So a stuntman had to be used in the entire sequence. He had to move his arms and legs very slowly to give the impression of being limp. The scene was shot at 96 frames per second, 
so that in the normal projection at 24 frames per second, the slowing down effect gave it a proper space drift sense. In producing the sequence, the astronaut had to collide with the pod arms many times in many takes and at twice the impact as the speed indicates in the film. So in essence, the stuntman was crashing into the pod's arms at a relatively high speed and they would slow it down in post-production. And again, we're looking straight up towards the ceiling in this shot. The soundstage was all black and the wire was likely also black or in shadow enough to be simply matted out if it peeked out from behind the actor before they added the star background. Needless to say, that must have been a rough day for the stuntman considering the shot was originally meant to have a dummy. They had another full-size pod constructed with completely motorized articulated arms. It took 10 or 12 men at long control consoles to simultaneously control the finger, wrist, forearm, elbow, and shoulder actions of the two pod arms, and the interior of that pod was a maze of servos, actuators, and cables. A separate pod interior set was constructed so that it could be taken apart in order to shoot different angles. You can see in this shot a graphic readout appearing on Dave's face. The displays wouldn't do this, so there must have been a projector set up specifically to project images onto Kier Delay's face, which not only helps light his face, but it adds a stylistic element that brings the pod setting into the shots that have a shallow depth of field. It also almost looks like war paint, making Dave appear a bit primitive, and further showing humanity's lower status on the evolutionary line to that of machines. The spacesuits were designed by Fred Ordway and Harry Lange to have a function and a purpose for every detail. In an interview, Fred Ordway said, We took the design to a contractor for execution. Harry was the designer in that case and the artist. They were designed and Stanley approved them. They were designed before we left for England. They were designed when we were working in New York City still, but they were physically created over in England for the shooting of the film. Harry Lange also designed the space helmets. The watches that Dave and Frank wear were designed special for the film by Hamilton Watches and were advertised as sort of a tie-in product to capitalize on the buzz around the film as well as the popularity of the space age. It's described as a watch for space age travelers which curves around one side of the wrist and has a porthole to show the month, day, and Greenwich Mean Time. The outer rim of the dial can be used to measure elapsed time. The watch is also equipped with a buzzer which rings when the elapsed time is up. We can see both of the men wearing the watch in several of the shots of them in the Discovery, but it looks as though they removed the watch when they put on their spacesuits. In Bernstein's visit to the set, he wrote about how much thought was put into each and every detail, and here, he shares a memory about the shoulder patches. Associate producer Victor Linden fished from a manila envelope a number of shoulder patches designed to be worn as identification by the astronauts. Kubrick said that the lettering didn't look right and suggested that the art department make up new patches using actual NASA lettering. He then consulted one of the small notebooks in which he lists all the current production problems along with the status of their solutions, and announced that he was going to the art department to see how the drawings of the moons of Jupiter were coming along. We now reach one of the most iconic scenes of the film, the scene where Dave asks Hal to open the pod bay doors. It doesn't take long for Dave to realize that he is arguing with an entity that cannot be reasoned with. Hal's calm and relaxed voice works perfectly to contrast the tension of the scene. This was one of the most brilliant casting decisions made in the history of motion pictures. The voice of Hal was played by an actor named Douglas Rain, but he wasn't the original choice for the part. Kubrick and Clark had originally intended for the onboard computer to be named Athena and voiced by a female actor. By the time they got to production, this was changed to Hal, which stood for Heuristically Programmed Algorithmic Computer in the novel. Kubrick originally wanted to hire Martin Balsam to play the part of Hal. You might remember him as the detective in Alfred Hitchcock's 1960 film, Psycho. Here's what he sounds like. Uh, now, if this uh, girl, Marion Crane, were here, you wouldn't be hiding her, would you? Not if she paid you well? Let's just say for the, uh, just for the sake of argument that she wanted you to uh, gallantly protect her. You'd know that you were being used, that uh, you wouldn't be made a fool of, would you? Kubrick ultimately decided against using him. When asked about it, Kubrick said, We had some difficulty deciding exactly what Hal should sound like, and Marty just sounded a little bit too colloquially American, whereas Rain had the kind of bland mid-Atlantic accent we felt was right for the part. Kubrick then hired an English actor named Nigel Davenport who actually came to the set, but he later thought that Davenport's accent was a little too thick, so he decided to leave it to be chosen during the post-production process, where the role eventually went to Douglas Rain. So he gave the task to his assistant director, Derek Cracknell, uh, who sounded like this. This is what I heard. Dive, dive, better take a stress pill, Dave, to all like that. You know, it sounded a bit like, uh, you know, Michael Caine. <laughs> and Keir Delay didn't actually hear Hal's real voice until he saw the premiere. I thought the computer, when they finally, when Stanley would finish the film, would be like, uh, we are like this, I am a computer, you know what I mean. Douglas Rain was discovered from a 1960 documentary titled Universe by the National Film Board of Canada, a documentary that received a nomination for Best Documentary Short at the Academy Awards the following year. Douglas Rain provided the narration for the documentary, and it sounded like this. Its surface moves in perpetual darkness, 
and unimaginable cold. For the sun is four billion miles away, only a starry speck in the sky. Douglas Rain is Canadian, as were many of the actors in the film. They shot the film in England, where a lot of Canadian actors went for work, because they were allowed to work in England without a work permit. Rain was originally asked to do the narration for 2001, before being offered the role of Hal. On his work in the film, Rain was quoted saying, I wrapped up my work in nine and one half hours. Kubrick is a charming man, most courteous to work with. He was a bit secretive about the film. I never saw the finished script, and I never saw a foot of the shooting. And Kubrick said, maybe next time I'll show Rain in the flesh, but it would be a non-speaking part, which would perfectly complete the circle. Rain didn't like talking about 2001, and it seemed he was a bit annoyed for his many years as an accomplished actor being eclipsed by one day's work. The look of Hal was such a beautiful design, simple and elegant. This picture shows a breakdown of the design. Kubrick was quoted saying, many designs for Hal were worked up. The final design took shape at the last minute, as most things you do in a film. You wait as long as you can to see if anyone comes up with anything better, and you finally choose what seems best. There's a kind of beauty and menace all at once in the hue of Hal's eye, which of course is simply a camera lens. I think the best evidence of Kubrick's genius is how a simple lens can seem to convey so many different emotions to an audience. It is just a close-up of a lens with a light behind it. It is perhaps the purest example of the Kuleshov effect. For those unfamiliar, a Soviet filmmaker in the 1910s named Lev Kuleshov found that by preceding the same exact footage of a man looking into the camera with different clips, a bowl of soup, a deceased child, or a sexy woman would convey to the audience that the man had a look of hunger, sadness, or lust, despite it being the same exact clip of the man. It is likely that the close-up that we see of Hal is in fact the same exact footage over and over and over again, and yet the context makes it feel completely different. Film analyst Rob Agar put forth the idea of the monolith being a symbol of a movie screen rotated 90 degrees, which becomes even more interesting when you consider Hal's lens as well. It's as if the two inanimate objects possess a teacher-learner relationship. The monolith, the movie screen, is transmitting humanity or evolution, and Hal, the camera lens, receives it. I imagine that it's very difficult to convey such power with something as simple as a block of wood painted black or a camera lens. But what's interesting is that I found a clip of Kubrick praising Arthur C. Clarke for the same thing. He can take an, an inanimate object, uh, like a star or a world or even a galaxy, and uh, somehow uh, make it into a, um, a very poignant uh, thing which almost seems alive. He has a way of... Um, writing about, uh, you know, mountains and planets and uh, worlds with the same poignancy that people write about uh, children or love affairs. As was mentioned previously, Hal seems to express more genuine human emotion than his human counterparts, which some criticize as being an issue with the actors. On the subject, Kubrick had this to say. This was a point that seemed to fascinate some negative critics who felt that it was a failing of this section of the film, that there was more interest in Hal than in the astronauts. In fact, of course the computer is the central character of this segment of the story. If Hal had been a human being, it would have been obvious to everyone that he had the best part and was the most interesting character. He took all the initiatives and all the problems related to and were caused by him. Some critics seem to feel that because we were successful in making a voice, a camera lens, and a light come alive as a character, this necessarily meant that the human characters failed dramatically. In fact, I believe that Keir DeLay and Gary Lockwood, the astronauts, reacted appropriately and realistically to their circumstances. One of the things we are trying to convey in this part of the film is the reality of a world populated, as ours soon will be, by machine entities who have as much or more intelligence as human beings and who have the same emotional potentialities in their personalities as human beings. We wanted to stimulate people to think what it would be like to share a planet with such creatures. In the specific case of Hal, he had an acute emotional crisis because he could not accept evidence of his own fallibility. The idea of neurotic computers is not uncommon. Most advanced computer theorists believe that once you have a computer which is more intelligent than man, and capable of learning by experience, it's inevitable that it will develop an equivalent range of emotional reactions. Fear, love, hate, envy, etc. Such a machine could eventually become as incomprehensible as a human being and could, of course, have a nervous breakdown, as Hal did in the film. In the December 1965 draft of the screenplay, this iconic scene doesn't exist. Frank does go out to replace the antenna where he's killed by Hal piloting one of the pods, but in the script, Dave doesn't go out to retrieve him. Instead, he has an argument with Hal over switching to manual control of the ship so that he may wake the other crew members from hibernation. Hal reluctantly agrees, but then opens all of the doors to the ship, including the pod bay doors, which lets out all of the air due to the vacuum of space. Dave quickly activates the emergency airlock, puts on a spacesuit, and proceeds to disconnect Hal. Of course, in the film, Dave enters the airlock by using the pod's explosive bolts. This scene was done in only one take. How was that done? 
because it looks like I'm weightless, right? It was built upside down that way. So the, 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 the pod, the front of the pod was up there and the camera's down here, right? And they had a wire that was, uh, I was attached to a wire which was out of sight because uh, my body would be between the, the lens and the wire. And uh, the wire was woven into a piece of rope uh, and a, a circus, a circus roustabout had measured the drop and then he tied a huge knot. Then he measured the same distance again and tied another knot. On action, I dove headfirst free fall toward my, um, by the way, why didn't they use a stunt, be, a stunt man? Because I've forgotten my helmet. So I go few free fall toward the lens down here and uh, the roustabout up there is waiting for that big knot to reach his very gloved hands. When it reaches his hands, he jumps off the platform, hurtles to the ground, I go hurtling back up to the ceiling, and then he's waiting for the second knot, and again, he lets go and I go hurtling back. So that's how I got that kind of bouncing back and forth, as you saw. This scene is actually scientifically accurate. A human can survive in the vacuum of space for at least a minute. He won't explode or freeze solid or anything like that. The only thing is that Dave should have exhaled his breath instead of inhaling, because the vacuum would suck all of the air out of his lungs. And now we reach Hal's demise. All of these handheld shots of Dave making his way to Hal's brain were done by Kubrick himself, and that shot from behind Dave where he walks to the ladder was all one shot. In this first shot inside Hal's brain, Kier Delay was hanging upside down. That way, his body would hide the wire he was suspended from and it would look like he was completely weightless. You can get a sense of how the set was oriented by this photo, and if you look closely you can just barely make out the wire. This looks like a test shot with a stand-in. The only major accident in the production occurred when a workman broke his back in a fall from the top of this set as he tried to catch a toppling light. The set was three stories high. In the closer shots, Kier Delay was just standing upright. For these shots, he would move his body in a subtle way as if he was weightless. In a previous video, I talked about how Kier Delay played the scene similarly to the end of Of Mice and Men, where a man must shoot his mentally disabled friend in order to avoid him being lynched by an angry mob for accidentally killing a young woman. The song Hal sings while being deactivated was a song titled Daisy Bell, which was written in 1892 by Harry Dacker. Hal singing this song carries a specific significance as it was the first song sung by a computer. An IBM 704 at Bell Labs sang the song in 1961 as a demonstration of computer speech synthesis. Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. I'm out crazy all for the love of you. It won't be a stylish marriage. I can't. Arthur C. Clarke was at the demonstration, which is why he chose to reference it in the novel. The sequence ends with Dave receiving a video message from Floyd revealing the actual reason behind the mission. So the basic information of the story that needs to be communicated is this. Two astronauts have been on board a ship controlled by an infallible human-like computer for quite some time on their way to explore Jupiter. It is suggested that the astronauts aren't abreast of all the information about the mission, which has been shrouded in secrecy. One day, the infallible computer makes a mistake and refuses to accept responsibility. The two astronauts decide that there might be something wrong with the computer and talk about disconnecting it. The computer finds out and kills one of the astronauts, as well as those in hibernation, while the other escapes death and disconnects the computer. The last living astronaut then discovers the true reason behind the mission. This information is communicated in a couple of different ways. The main way is through montage. We observe the two astronauts in their regular routine, which introduces us to the characters, the setting, and the circumstances. Here, our interest is held by the circumstances that preceded the sequence in the film, as well as a new, strange, and special effects heavy set. We also become lost in the world of the story through spending time playing out routine procedures that another film would likely shy away from in favor of a quicker pace. Through the realistic pace that Kubrick sets for us, we become more immersed in the circumstances and the mindset of the characters. HAL is also a very unique and interesting concept. You'll notice that Kubrick gives us a few key locations to cycle between, and we'll leave a location and return to it under new circumstances. For example, we go outside the ship with Dave to retrieve the AE-35 unit, but when we go back outside the ship with Frank, it is the scene of his murder. By showing Dave going outside in the pod once before Hal locks him out, 
we have a certain familiarity with the idea of going out in the pod before the predicament arises. Kubrick also saves the set of Hal's brain for the climax of the sequence. This set is in and of itself a revelation that works alongside the revelations of the scene. Because there isn't much dialogue, the story is projected onto the actors, rather than the actors projecting the story. Looks between the human characters and body language can communicate the subtext of the scenes, and even the lack of expression and emotion works to act as a vessel for the audience's emotion, rather than dictating the emotion to the audience. As for Hal, some of the most powerful shots of him aren't accompanied by dialogue at all, but rather the implication that he is watching and the consideration of what he's thinking. The main shot types in this sequence can be categorized as such. Long shots or wide angle shots most often to show off the set. Medium or long shots with dynamic blocking, with a deliberate stylized feeling. Close ups with a shallow depth of field. Notice how we don't see the full circle of Hal's lens. This feels more imposing, but it also works with the space helmets to feel claustrophobic. Hal's POV as characterized as having an iris mat. Handheld shots in order to feel disheveled and in Dave's mindset. And the special effects shots of models to give legitimacy to the setting. And as Douglas Trumbull said, possibly one of the most unusual aspects of the live action photography on the interior sets of 2001 is that almost all lighting was an actual integral part of the set itself, and additional lighting was used only for critical close ups. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I have a couple more videos in the works on Kubrick, so if you're new here, please hit that subscribe button now because there are plenty more videos on the way for cinephiles like you. And if you'd like to help me create more videos, please consider pledging to my Patreon. As little as a dollar will help immensely and give you some cool perks. Thanks again for watching.